All right, I promised our presenter we'd get started right at noon today. Um, he's got a lot of stuff to get through and um, he's a busy guy. We're happy to have Simon with us today. I'm not even sure he really uh, needs an introduction if you're involved at all in uh, the Blackboard community. I'm sure you've seen him, uh, his posts uh, um, quite a bit. Um, this is, uh, like I said, in the email a presentation that he gave at Blackboard World in New Orleans this year uh, and was kind enough to agree to present it to us today for all of those who weren't able to be there or um, if you're like me and you were there and had to pick between a handful of excellent sessions going on at the same time. So uh, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Simon and let him get started. All right. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, again, my name is Simon Mahayevsky. I actually teach at uh, Green Valley State University. And uh, gamification is uh, something that uh, I uh, wasn't interested in when I taught uh, advanced courses. So I used to teach some Unix, Oracle, and other courses. And the uh, interesting part was that I thought students were already engaged, possibly because they were weeded through already and they already committed to the major. And everything I said was very interesting. <laughs> this all changed when uh, I started to teach uh, an introductory class at uh, Grand Valley. And uh, I saw this uh, um, other area where uh, it wasn't just uh, the technology. In fact, some students did not like technology. They had uh, a little bit of a um, stereotype threat uh, against it. And um, and so that's that's when I uh, started to investigate this idea of gamification. By the way, um, I, I will have the, the chat window open if um, you have questions uh, during uh, my presentation here. Feel free to, to, um, to send it. Um, I, I think that uh, this subject of gamification is an interesting one. However, uh, it is a controversial one to some degree because of uh, the role that games uh, have in our Western culture. See, if we, if we were in uh, the uh, ancient Greece, games would have had a lot of respect. There would be certainly glory in uh, in, uh, in, in games, uh, and not just the Olympic games, but uh, you know the historical uh, accounts of the Lydians who uh, were able to survive through uh, famine because they would eat one day and they would play games the next. And uh, that kind of a story of survival goes uh, really to the core of what games can do for people, and that is they can tug at a very uh, emotional, areas of, of ourselves, and because of that, they can be used for intrinsic motivation. Uh, I'll give you an example. So let's say that you would like to have uh, students exercise in the field. Well, you can tell them to run around the field, and they will do that because they, they, they will comply. But you put a, a soccer ball in the middle of the field, you give some basic rules, and you know what? They will exercise, and they will laugh, and they will have fun doing that, and they'll do that a lot longer than what you ask them. Um, so that's a little bit of um, where I think gamification has a potential, um, not even just in education, but in other ways. Uh, take Nike, for example, and, and being able to track how far you're running and how fast you're running and how your shoes are performing. Uh, those are now business-tested uh, ways of using this kind of a gameful design and gameful thinking to promote certain behaviors and to even propel a business uh, forward. So that's uh, a little bit of an introduction of um, where this whole idea is coming from. And uh, this um, definition that I use of gamification is the use of game mechanics and experience design to digitally engage and motivate people to achieve their goals. This happens to be a definition by Gartner and, and Berkey. He works for Gartner. Uh, the more common definition is by Detterding, uh, a researcher from Germany, who says that gamification is the use of game mechanics in non-game environments. So let's start with this uh, uh, graph, this drawing. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with it. Uh, this is the learning pyramid, and, and much of the training today is um, dedicated to this pyramid. Uh, if you took a little bit of time to look into it, you'll find that this pyramid is not based on research. This is something that was, um, the graph was borrowed from a 1946 paper uh, that did not um, 
say what the graph is today used to, to explain. So back then, uh, the idea was to connect various methods of teaching into, uh, into a process. Uh, Today we use this graph to show that lecturing and uh, being the sage on the stage uh, is not good for students. What we know about lecturing is that it actually does work, that um, especially just depending on the subject, especially in advanced courses, uh, lecturing can be very beneficial once students are engaged. Um, but that uh, the other areas, especially when we talk about active learning, now active learning like uh, uh, clickers and um, and uh, role-based learning, also um, problem-based uh, learning, those have some research behind them showing that they are uh, more effective than when students aren't doing anything and just are, are listening, sort of passive listeners. However, this pyramid um, is, is, is uh, a good example of um, the education business sort of running on on hype and running on uh, an idea which is sort of an allegory uh, and something that uh, that uh, we then use to adjust uh, education let's um, look at this little research uh, that uh, is not brand new but it shows us that uh, when you put people into a room and you have them stay with their thoughts just for 15 minutes uh, and the only device in the room is a button that will give you electric shock. And, and you're told not to use it ahead of time, that it will hurt when you use it. Uh, surprisingly, because people are bored, they are willing to shock themselves multiple times um, in order to avoid this feeling of boredom. And that, that's repeated uh, multiple times in, in, uh, in research because that experiment uh, is something that we all can can relate to. So sitting in the classroom and uh, and being bored uh, is is worse than being in pain. So I think from that perspective alone, it's uh, it's important to set in in perspective a lot of the things that we do in the classroom. Um, I think it was uh, Feynman who, uh, who who said in his textbook, uh, not, not textbook, but the book, uh, the joy of finding things out. He, he stated that uh, education is sort of a difficult place to do research because if an instructor comes up with something new and, uh, and he uses that in the classroom, it works for him and it builds engagement. Uh, however, next person uh, in the classroom is trying that and it does not work for them. And so the amount of variables to control uh, in uh, in instruction is, is very, very difficult. So we have some research that shows us that attractive instructors are more effective. Um, and the way this was uh, proven was uh, through audio lecture by the same person. And then on the screen, they would show a picture of an attractive instructor and then to another group of an instructor who was not physically attractive. And upon taking uh, exams, the students with the attractive instructor did better. So the amount of um, variables to consider in an educational environment is just, uh, just tremendous. So something to remember um, is uh, re research by, um, I think it was Johnson and Skinner, uh, who looked at the nature of human engagement in the classroom and how the nature of it is really reciprocal. In other words, if the faculty, if the instructor is engaged, excited about the way they teach and what they teach, then that spills over in the students. It's, it's then returned by students, making the instructor even more engaged. So this might explain why uh, so many ideas in education that are you know, used in the classroom uh, are successful at some point, but then uh, cannot find their broader uh, acceptance across all classrooms because uh, it is uh, the instructors are specifically not all that um, excited about it, and it wasn't their idea. So, this book here that uh, I want to advertise to you, uh, the Game Changer, by um, Jason Fox, uh, really worth reading, and there is an audio version on uh, on Audible. It really talks about how gamification is used in business, but, but all the principles apply to the classroom. And it talks about the game sort of definition that a game is a well-designed work. Uh, 
So if we look at instructional design, we look at all these efforts in Blackboard, maybe with exemplary courses, um, the basis for any good game is a good set of good instructions. See, it's very frustrating if you're playing a game, but then the instructions or the rules change during the game, or maybe uh, the game wasn't explained well to you ahead of time. So instructional design would be the foundation for gamification. Uh, we want to uh, make sure to utilize that ECP program with Blackboard to run some of our courses through um, ECP as we try new things. Because again, there might be engagement. Uh, we are excited about trying something new, but is the instructional value there? You know, do, do, do students still, um, if we ran through the checklist of the rubric from Blackboard, is this all still happening? So um, I uh, was able to uh, submit my gamification course uh, through this process, and uh, and it worked out. Um, the 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 rubric uh, lined up uh, well with uh, what the reviewers could see in terms of evidence of the course. But that's just something to remember that. Um, well-designed work is uh, exactly what uh, games are about. And the other part that games uh, require is immersive feedback. So what does that mean? Well, in the classroom, we provide feedback. We give grades. And we might even provide additional feedback uh, to students. But uh, if you consider playing a game, even a video game, your moves are all measured and you get this immediate feedback which helps you to improve things, helps you to, to get better. So at the instructional design uh, level, you know, can we have students uh, resubmit the same assignment multiple times? Uh, granted, in some courses, let's say this is an English class and students are writing, uh, writing papers, this is a lot more work. And so I don't, I don't have a solution for that at this point. Uh, what I can tell you about my class is that we are using, we used to use Engage, now we're using Pearson, but it's the same principle. Basically for Excel classes, for Access, for Microsoft Word classes, uh, we are able to assign assignments which students can submit and then five times correct with immediate grading being done by the computer. So because of this new technology and new efforts by the by the content uh, you know sources like like the textbook publishers uh, we are able to provide this more of an immersive feedback and because of that the classes do lend themselves more to this metaphor of a game uh, when you tell students that this class is going to be like a game, a couple of things will happen. You know, first of all, they do expect that uh, you know in a game there is feedback and and there are certain rules, and that their effort uh, makes a difference. But also, uh, it provides uh, a little bit of a perspective on the playfulness of learning, and uh, playfulness and learning are are very much related. Um, let me see if I have that. Um, uh, I'm going to skip to the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope you're flexible here with me as, as I'm going to um, uh, uh, return. So playfulness and learning are related. Uh, doctors, uh, Dr. Uh, Brown, uh, by the way, I was just thinking I had an extra slide there uh, with a link to, to his video. He has a um, Stuart Brown. Um, who established Institute of Play, uh, he did a little research on um, species, different species like, uh, let's say, dogs. <clears throat> how, do, how do animals learn? And it turns out that um, you know, a dog has this playful uh, bow stance. Uh, you maybe have seen that uh, legs stretch forward and, and the head goes down. And so that's a signal uh, that tells not just other dogs, but other species like humans, that now play will ensue. And during play, uh, biting is not going to be real. We're going to explore. And so that's how dogs learn about how to later maybe catch their prey and, and how to interact with, uh, with enemies. But uh, Dr. Brown noted that uh, you see, for example, a wolf do a playful uh, bow to a, a polar bear. And in that situation, the polar bear can respond with a, a playful activity. And so now across species, they are learning. 
So playfulness and learning are connected when we look at animals, but really, if we look at human beings, it's the same thing. I, I remember working on uh, some technology projects where the entire environment was just called play. And it was a test system where you, it was okay to break things. It was okay to, to, to fail. And, and that led to new knowledge, and that led to uh, employees uh, knowing more about the system. So if we consider reintroducing play into the classroom, um, students will be more likely to, to attempt a failure. Yes, thank you, Adam, I appreciate that. Um, so, so when it comes to then play, it opens up this kind of an emotional response of being willing to be vulnerable. And um, vulnerability, and innovation and learning are, are very much connected. Um, another researcher, um, uh, let's see, uh, I'm going to remember the name momentarily, but a researcher that uh, looks at uh, the relationship between shame uh, and guilt and vulnerability and, and points out that uh, really in our Western culture, just like games have fallen into this uh, area of child play and something that's inappropriate in, uh, in the workplace, uh, we do not do well with failure and we do not uh, do well with uh, processing it, which means that m much of the time a failure um, turns into shame, which is, is uh, different from guilt in that shame means you are a failure, you internalize that. Whereas guilt means that, yes, the failure happened and I might have been the cause of it, but guilt helps you to recover uh, and uh, turn it into a, a learning uh, moment and then be a motivator for further change. So if, if um, vulnerability then is connected to innovation, um, so just to support that, uh, if you do come up with something new, you have a little invention, when you describe it to someone else, uh, you see their vulnerability. What are they gonna say? Are they gonna like it? Are they gonna say this, this was no good? And if you do say, okay, this is stupid, you know, you're, you're not an inventor, this, this moment might change the innovator's, you know, life altogether. And so the way we deal with failure in the classroom then uh, can either encourage innovation, exploration, and learning, or it can turn on that, uh, you know, typical approach of uh, uh, the F grade is shame, and then, uh, you know, you need to uh, find a different subject matter to master because you're just not good at this. Which brings me to uh, Carol Dweck and uh, Carol Dweck's research into mindfulness where she divides uh, students into two groups of people, not just students but people in general, ones with fixed mindset which means that I'm good at certain things, I'm good at math, uh, I'm not good at music, uh, so by the way I'm not touching a musical instrument again in my life. So that's fixed mindset. Uh, as opposed to a grow, growth mindset, which says, you know, I'm, I'm great at math, um, I, I'm not doing well with music, but, you know, if I spend enough time with music, uh, I, I can get better at it. And if we know anything about Bach and the connection of music to math, you know, this would be a very reasonable, very reasonable stance. So what Carol Dweck did in the school in Chicago was they, they changed the grade of F into the grade of not yet. Okay, so the not yet grade meant that, okay, you are not a failure, you can do better in this area, uh, and you will if you, if you put more effort in it. So it's a not yet. So this idea that uh, any subject matter can be mastered to a certain degree by any individual, I think we've, we've, we've sort of left that as, 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 as a, as a uh, Western um, culture because we, we want people to be specialized, we want to recognize very quickly, are they more of a college person, are they more of a trades person? We want to recognize quickly, you know, if they fit into STEM or not. Uh, in fact, uh, plenty of uh, faculty in, in surveys show that, um, especially in STEM, they view uh, successful instruction um, when uh, students uh, leave uh, STEM. So we are going to spare you the rigors of uh, of uh, STEM um, work uh, because simply you're unfit and my job here is to weed you through, this is a gatekeeping course. 
So this is sort of an approach that uh, removes playfulness from learning and, uh, and it does close doors. So what, uh, what we're trying to do um, with gamification or what I try to do in my research is to really gear it towards uh, introductory courses for a couple of reasons. One, they're a great business for universities. We want a lot of students taking introductory courses, even if if uh, they're they're not uh, a part of any major at this point. But we, we want these to be very successful. We want people to speak well of the introductory courses. Um, also, um, those introductory courses, of course, are a funnel to our programs, and therefore there is a, a business re reason for that. The introductory courses often fall on part-time faculty. Uh, why? Because the amount of them is unspecified and they're difficult to teach. They're difficult to teach because the subject matter is so broad that uh, um, it, it can be boring. It's often broad and shallow and so uh, tenure fact faculty often choose not to teach these classes so we hire part-time help and and that can go poorly when it comes to that whole reciprocal value of, of engagements. Students often don't want to be there because um, they they read on ratemyprofessors.com about how, uh, how, how terrible the experience is and then the faculty often don't want to be there because this is a class that's boring, it's, it's likely moderated or, or coordinated across multiple multiple sections. Therefore, they're given a, sta a stack of slides to talk about and their hands are tied. So I think here is where the gamification can fit in really, really well because it's going to play uh, and, and, and motivate both the faculty and the student. So here are a few books I'd like to recommend to you. The first one, Louder Than Words, this is um, a book about how our minds simulate while we use speech. So as we create sentences, as we communicate, our mind actually is a simulator. So it's almost like the mind plays games with us. And so um, a great study in, uh, in, in communication. The Lost Art of Listening, uh, very nice book that basically helps us to understand that much of our stress in life and much of the problems we see in the classroom is because we are not listened to as individuals. Uh, we either don't give feedback or don't receive the right feedback, but how being listened to can play a tremendous role in how we feel about learning and how we feel about uh, the place we are uh, in life. Finally, the uh, how emotions are made book that really shows that everything that we think um, is, is real uh, is constructed. And when trying to design experience for students in the classroom, uh, we really have to have the kind of Carol Dweck's um, mind of, of growth that you can construct positive emotions even in the most boring subject matter and, and uh, the most difficult situation of having too many kids in the classroom. So the construction of, of emotions and how uh, when we say that uh, we have to just uh, rationalize and, and just turn emotions off, how impossible it is, how emotions are tied to uh, our thinking and and a good lesson on, on then how to take that um, to, to our course level. So let's talk for a second about why gamification uh, why now specifically? And so the roots of gamification, and, and there is quite a quite a bit of gamification um, uh, culture, I guess, building up across various industries. First of all, at the end of '90s, uh, we have uh, positive psychology, which was developed, and positive psychology is different from the traditional psychology. The traditional psychology means to improve the lot of those who are mentally sick. And so uh, you need a psychologist when you are not doing well. When you're doing well, then go live your life. So positive psychology with um, uh, specifically Mihai Chiksam Mihai being uh, the researcher from uh, University of Chicago, he uh, brings out this idea of flow. So when a human being finds something interesting, maybe a hobby or, or some other area of interest, maybe maybe it's biking or running, uh, if the activity is set between two difficult tasks and two easy tasks, we enter the state of flow. And flow means that our minds are tied in and the time just flies. And that is sort of the optimal experience for humans. And this whole idea of positive psychology then is turned into 
um, a number of, of books that, that follow that really help us to take something that already works into something that works a lot better. So some of the books that I mentioned uh, in the next row there, uh, of course, uh, James Collins, Good to Great, or um, Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal. This book will talk about how uh, games can uh, have the opportunity to have major changes uh, on the world. Uh, if for nothing else, it's just the amount of time that gamers spend today uh, socializing, but also building things. Uh, so World of Warcraft, uh, you know, we have people never leaving their their basement because of how engaging the game is. And so, uh, Jim McGonagall mentions universities that are using games now to solve real life problems, like trying to solve uh, some problems of cancer and, and the sequencing of, of of genome. So there are people who are able now to capture. Um, this kind of a high level of engagement into solving real life problems. Um, Daniel's, Daniel Pink's book, The Drive, um, it uh, touches on the self determination theory. Um, and the, the, the theory developed in the year 2000 um, talks about three things that are necessary to be happy with a task, with a job, or with a class. One is a purpose. So if we can uh, create uh, a paragraph in Blackboard that talks to students about why is this class important. Uh, in, in technology, I can uh, explain that everything you will do in the future is going to have to do with technology. Uh, you'll be dating through technology. You'll be applying for a job. You likely will be working with it. So creating this kind of epic meeting, which is one of the uh, gameful design principles. You know, you're the only one who can who can save um, the galaxy. So purpose is important. Um, you can look at uh, even relationships being that way. That uh, the relationships that uh, are most fulfilling, we can see a purpose down the road, uh, a greater meaning. And companies do that today, where uh, companies selling shoes promises, if you buy a shoe from us, we will send one to Africa. So they're building purpose so that that's present not just for customers, but also for employees. The second thing that self determination theory talks about is uh, mastery. So in this activity or in this relationship, we want to see progress. We want to be in a job that has growth opportunities. And we want to be in the classroom where we can see the progress that we've taken already. So. That means uh, objectives and then uh, helping students to see how they've completed these uh, objectives. This idea of growth and mastery is then the second element. And the third one is autonomy. So you can be in a relationship, but if you're being checked on all the time, or you can be on a job where someone is looking over your shoulder all the time, you are not going to flourish there. You, you, you are not going to be happy. So can we give students some autonomy in the classroom when it comes to projects and, and, and picking the subject matter? Uh, University of Michigan uh, has um, this project called um, Gradecraft. And there, the, the, the class that uses this LMS is entirely embedded into a game. And the student chooses what assignments within groups, what assignments to complete and not complete. So this idea of autonomy uh, helps students to find the flow, to find uh, satisfaction in, in the activity. So again, self-determination theory talks about purpose, it talks about mastery, and it talks about autonomy. So another reason why now we're talking about gamification is because certainly software, especially cloud software, uh, is moving forward. So we have such tools as Class Dojo, we have uh, Mozilla Open Badges, we have Classcraft, uh, and the Great Craft, which I mentioned earlier. So sometimes uh, applying gamification to your course is easy as adopting some of these tools. Finally. Um, it's important to consider the generation of faculty. We often talk about generations of students, but uh, the generation of faculty that are now taking uh, full-time positions uh, in, in, in other universities, uh, they are from the Atari era. And so they um, know what it means to be fully engaged into immersive feedback environment and how to find a kind of a, a flow um, feeling. Uh, this sort of takes me back to 2001 um, in, in this work by Prensky on um, digital natives, which by now we know that digital natives don't, don't really exist. But in his work, he, he used this expression that um, 
students come from homes where they work with technology, often play games as well, but they know what it feels like to be fully engaged. Then they come to our classrooms and, and, and they're disappointed and they become disengaged. So while the digital natives don't exist from perspective of knowing more than, than faculty about uh, computers, um, I think there's a lot to be said about people who are raised on technology and on a device that gives them this immediate feedback and immersive feedback in the feeling of, oh, I'm improving all this time and I have autonomy to either use the device or not use the device. Uh, so I think that that is an important uh, point. Now, Bernard de Coven uh, wrote this book in the 70s, The Well-Played Game. And one of the reasons why Atari era was in existence altogether is because back then, uh, games, board games, and outs, playing games outside it was very popular. You know, you would have a, a sharp knife, and then we had all these games you would play, uh, you know, in the grass to try to, uh, you know, put the knife between uh, the feet of, of your opponent and... Uh, uh, Today, you know, you probably get arrested for for those games on on the playground. But uh, uh, back then, you know, the the idea of playing games uh, was was being released to the wild as a way to change education, as a way to to really help people to be uh, to to be different. And and I think that what we were missing back then was. Um, the, the amount of technology, but also this idea of positive technology and so a positive psychology. In saying that, just because something isn't broken, uh, doesn't mean that uh, we, we can't make it work really, really well, and that our perspective, either emotional or otherwise, that we constructed of okay, this is good enough, that uh, that that is uh, uh, something that really need to be reevaluated. So moving forward, then. Um, I want to talk about Blackboard Learn a little more specifically. So if this is a good time for gamification, right, so how do we do that in Blackboard? So I want to uh, make a few suggestions. Uh, one, to look for uh, ways to provide immersive feedback. So how can you do that? Well, in the classroom, you see you have uh, a couple of um, opportunities and I'll divide them into a short game in, and, and a long game and so that's a little theory that I'm developing for gamification uh, short game being just the lecture times and so why not try active learning why not try the clicker or top hat or poll everywhere or Kahoot I find Kahoot to be really really great um, it has a few uh, advantages over some of the other systems I've mentioned during Kahoot students have to look at the screen and read answers and their phones do not have have the word answers they they have matching symbols and colors so what that means is that student has to immediately look back and reconnect with the classroom and so especially when you play cahoots in teams which means that you have one device across two or three or more people uh, there's just this engagement that takes place and excitement but it allows you to provide immersive feedback during lecture time you know we all love Socratic method and um, you know um, asking a question and then having people speak back to you, you know, that works. But probably just like that uh, pyramid that we looked at earlier, uh, it is an improvement. Um, however, it does not give voice to everybody. You know, the students who are shy, the students who uh, are not as uh, quick perhaps, you know, they are overwhelmed by those confident ones, those who are going to uh, enjoy speaking first. Uh, I guess this is as good time as any to talk about Bartel's personality types, uh, which happens to be the types of personalities that we try to design activities for based on how gaming industry is writing their games. So there are four personality types. One is um, the influencer or, or the killer. Now, we call him influencer because it sounds better. But basically, that's the person in from the back of the classroom who wants to say all the jokes, who is going to be possibly the first one to raise their hand. Um, that's influencer. And in games, there are games that basically are made to uh, fulfill that kind of a personality. Uh, another type of personality is a socializer. So it's someone who just wants to pick every stone up and look underneath and just see, you know, um, explore everything. Uh, I'm sorry. So, um, so we, we started with influencer, and then um, I, I actually described explorer as the personality type, the one who 
picks up the stones. Socializer will be one who wants to relate to people, who does things in order to improve relationships, and who does well when a game somehow helps you to connect with others. There might be a, a, a chat system involved and to someone who, who is able to build relationships. So that's a socializer. So it was influencer, uh, explorer, a socializer, and then the last one is achiever. And so possibly many of our classes that are built around grades uh, really are aimed to satisfy this kind of personality of an achiever. And it's fair to say that we are probably combinations of these, but that uh, in order to have a really good game, you need to appeal to all four. So an achiever wants to be on the top of the leaderboard. They want to have all the experience points. They too might be the ones to raise their hand first to prove that they are um, uh, uh, they're worthy of, of, of that position. So in the classroom then, a uh, short game, active learning, an excellent way to improve lectures. Uh, but what about online classes and the online content? Well, how about uh, using these um, quiz tournaments? So you create a Blackboard quiz and you upload questions from the uh, publisher. And let's say it's a thousand questions. Then you set the uh, length of the quiz for only 15 minutes. And so you make the quiz automatically close after 15 minutes. So now the students have to answer as many questions as they can uh, within the 15 minutes. And now the student who has most of the correct answers, which in Blackboard Gradebook, you will be able to sort very easily, you will have a winner of, of this event. So that's, a, that's just a quick idea of a quiz tournament, which can be used for an online or classroom uh, course as a review for an exam. And so you would say, okay, this course will be open on Saturday, you know, from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. And so it has to be optional because all our game activities need to appeal to autonomy. Um, but uh, of course, students will also see the purpose in it because they can preview uh, questions and evaluate how well they, they know the subject matter. And they'll see mastery. They'll see how many questions they answered uh, correctly. Another way to engage with an online audience then would be through the course reports games. And this can be as simple as uh, say one week into an online course, you go to review course reports that are in Blackboard. And there you'll see which students made the most clicks or maybe which students spent the most time in uh, the Blackboard course. And without telling students ahead of time that that is the game, you basically are saying, uh, this student, you know, was the most active student uh, this week. They clicked on most things. This type of uh, uh, activity, and this is uh, the specific type of reward, which uh, Daniel Pink sort of explains really well in his book, the difference between rewards that are, now that you've completed this, here is the reward, versus rewards where we say, you will get this if you do these things. And the big difference is that if you were to say at the start of the semester, uh, after one week, I'll check reports, and students who clicked on most things will will win, you know, my praise or will win whatever it is that you're offering, maybe extra credit. Uh, students will optimize for it, and they will click mindlessly just to to score that. So certain report or re rewards have to be given as a result of a completed activity, so that what you actually are rewarding and what you're encouraging is. Um, the, the seeking out of positive behaviors and uh, you know by rewarding the student here who had most clicks you know uh, you're not going to promise that this will ever happen again but you're saying that students you know who are most engaged in the course that uh, that we pay attention to that and then we have ways to see again that there's a there's immersive feedback now the next uh, part to talk about in Blackboard will be adaptive release which is a functionality in Blackboard that provides uh, Boolean uh, logic uh, and it, it allows us to reveal certain parts of Blackboard uh, based on uh, activities of students, so maybe specific grade in the class. So when it comes, for example, to uh, my course, I use uh, this system called MyGame and um, uh, MyGame can be found um, under uh, game.data2.com. Um, so this is uh, this is a, a mobile app basically that uh, allows me to um, collect to have students collect text codes 
enter them in, and as they do, uh, their experience uh, grows. They, they add experience points. So each text code is worth some experience points. And it can be as easy as saying, um, I have um, I have a chapter one here. I have a question for you in chapter one. And the answer to chapter one is this uh, single um the answer to the chapter one question is a single word. Now, go and find it. So the students can try as many codes as they want to. And when they find the right one, they, they get credit to the points. This also works for QR codes. So with the app, you can scan QR codes that uh, that, that you've uh, uh, accounted for. Uh, here at GVSU, we have a lot of art everywhere. So students in my class go to scan the QR codes next to many, many art pieces that we have. And uh, so that helps them to get a little experience with, uh, with QR codes. Uh, but uh, by, for example, uh, putting mark review buttons across my course. I tell students to find those mark review buttons. I don't tell them how many there are. But when they click on all mark review buttons, the adaptive release will show them the game code at some point. Um, so the adaptive release can be used to automate certain parts of the course and to really provide uh, a unique path through the course for the students. It could be that based on performance on an exam, you open a folder for students that has some remedial uh, information and work uh, versus if they perform really well, maybe you show them a congratulatory uh, message. Uh, connected to adaptive release then are the achievements or badges in Blackboard. So badges are um, a way to reward students with something that they can um, keep for after the course is done. You design a little badge with a picture, and you can set your exam. Uh, and then inside of the badge, you would say, if the student passes the exam at 95% or more, they will receive this badge. And Blackboard uh, will show the badge when this uh, requirement is met. And now students can export this badge into uh, into their Mozilla backpack. And so completely outside of Blackboard when your course is not available, they'll still have that. And this brings this idea of mastery again. So students can see their progress. They can they even see more of a purpose because now they can use this badge to include in their portfolio and their resume. So badges are, are, are a great way to touch on um, just a small part of gamification. It, it would be a mistake to view gamification only through the uh, lens of experience points, badges, and leaderboards. Uh, but that is something that, that Blackboard does allow. And then we have environments that are partner-based, like uh, Cengage, Pearson, Duolingo, Kahoot. All of these will produce reports that will tell you how many correct answers students uh, had on a Kahoot, how well they did in the language study via Duolingo. And because of that, you can import these uh, into whatever experience point system you're using. You can import that and, um, and, and basically make it part of your course. So even if it's as simple as getting extra credit for completing Duolingo systems, you create a course in Duolingo, and then you can uh, run the, um, the class with that additional uh, practice that students uh, are, are performing. So these integrations are there, and they can be used. I already mentioned the ECP program, the ECP program being the um, um, Exam for the course program, and uh, I encourage everyone to to uh, use it because this is really how we uh, establish good foundation for gamification. And then the XP ledger I mentioned, gamedatadata.com, it's a way to to adopt this uh, experience point uh, ledger uh, for for your own class. Uh, so I already explained how students uh, gain the points, but then they can also spend the points by purchasing late assignments. You can, uh, you, they can spend the points by maybe getting LinkedIn recommendations from you. Uh, there are a number of ways where this becomes now a currency so that it's separated from grades. So we don't want these experience points to become grades uh, so that we maintain the autonomy, but then also we have a chance of shaping the experience of uh, students. I'm going to uh, paste in uh, a link to a ResearchGate project where I have a few uh, papers on the subject. There is a great paper from the University of Illinois at Chicago using this game.data2.com uh, ledger. Um, 
and it's in a linguistic course, uh, Germanic studies. Um, also, my case study here at GVSU is based on this program, and uh, my uh, course, of course, is a, um, it's a STEM uh, class. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Uh, anything that uh, anybody would like to uh, ask about? Uh... All right, so we'll keep thinking about that, but uh, I do want to point out uh, the Octalysis website, which allows you to take a course or any other subject and uh, evaluate it as to how well it fits into a gamification principles a set. Um, and so as you explain what your class does, you'll get a nice shot um, a report on uh, which elements to improve in order to make it a better game. Uh, another author here, uh, Andrzej Marczewski from uh, Great Britain, who has uh, a number of uh, uh, great blogs, but, but also a book about how to implement games into non-game environments. And so this relatedness, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, um, uh, they're all related to that self-determination uh, theory. Uh, here is uh, a part of my case study and a graph that basically is uh, showing how students were reporting answer to the question, was this class intellectual stimulating? Which is, I think, uh, rather difficult to, to, to do in an Excel slash access slash Microsoft Word class. And so this uh, intellectual stimulation then happens through uh, introducing material that becomes optional and becomes just part of the game, part of the experience shaping system to gain experience points and to get students uh, excited. And here we have a graph that shows uh, optional assignments. So this course already has 49 graded assignments. And I asked students to do optional assignments just for experience points. And so the blue line is the average. Uh, so the, the percentage of students uh, and how many assignments they completed, there were about 23 additional assignments, which of course provide for additional practice, uh, but just show that students are willing to play a game and just for the heck of it, do more assignments and as they complete them, uh, gain more uh, course experience. Uh, this graph that shows how over a period of time, because this case study took place over a number of years, uh, how students were completing missions. So you see the peaks here would be times uh, at the end of the semester and then the startup of uh, just getting the game introduced and doing some basic missions uh, right up to uh, a lot of practice and, and activity towards uh, the end of the semester. So in terms of some of the uh, data uh, coming out of this case study, um, the, the reports were, um, were, were, were rather um, successful and good. Um, the uh, question, I enjoyed lectures in this class out of five, uh, the uh, um, average was 4.4. Um, then in terms of uh, uh, the um, rating on the uh, Rate My Professor's website, um, this class also you know, showed some, some good results. And this is my favorite quote from uh, end of course um, of semester evaluations. You know, even though he doesn't take attendance, almost the whole class shows every Monday and Wednesday. I feel that the professor really works with the students in his class instead of expecting students to come to class because they're afraid they'll fail if they don't. And I think the reason why um, you know students are excited is not just because of gamification and the points and so forth, but because of the result that the playing of the game has on the instructor. If the instructor can contribute these crazy things that they are interested in, maybe their research is, is part of, if they have um, themselves the autonomy and the, and, 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 the, and the purpose that they realize and the mastery they can see with students progressing, that gets the, the faculty involved and engaged. And so that has reciprocal quality to engage the students and then the other way around. So from, from, from that perspective, I think gamification does have um, a good um, place and in, 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 in some promising uh, uh, goals and, and, and role to play. So this, uh, there's a number of links here uh, to papers uh, throughout the slides. Uh, I wasn't sure, Adam, if we're able to, to share the actual links uh, at, at some point. Uh, but there is a place in uh, the Blackboard community uh, where we can do that as well. Uh, Adam? 
Uh, yeah, I'll share the recording on the MyBug paging community, and I'll attach the actual slideshow too so they can get to those. Uh, the recording actually also records the chat, so at least the two or three links that are in there now will be accessible through the recording, I believe. Um, but yeah, I'll make okay. sure everything's up there. Okay, so uh, in, in Blackboard we have this community website, and there I have a, a gamification um, project. I will go ahead and, and type in that particular link. And um, I developed actually some software for Blackboard, uh, which you can adopt now, um, which is an LTI and a, and a REST application, and it allows you to display your gradebook uh, in a uh, gamified uh, pro progress bar. So it'll show the student their own grade, and then it'll show everybody else's grades. Now, the names are changed, so it's all obfuscated. Uh, but uh, the student will see the progress bars of other students, so they'll see you know, where they are. Um, and it, it uh, is designed uh, you know, not to just show a regular bar graph, but to start at the average, and then to sort of spread both ways. So. Um, that's the first uh, story it tells. The second story it tells is there's a button there to click on, and it says change instructor, and it'll 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 change the data showing what uh, this class would be would have been like with another instructor. Now, of course, we have access to the Blackboard data, how other instructors are grading, you know, what the successes of students with other instructors. So you can change the instructor. You can also change semester. So if you want to know if you would have done better in the winter semester versus fall semester, it'll change. Uh, if at this point you're thinking that this is too, be, too good to be true, uh, it is uh, not true. So uh, this is actually randomized data, but it's, it's supposed to tell the story to the student that, you know, the failure, say, of this course is not just failure of your own, that this, that the interaction of instructor and the student together uh, plays a role. And so when they click that button, they see, oh, with another instructor, I would have done a lot better. But then they press again, and, and I would have done a lot worse. That's sort of the game that uh, that, that system is playing with the students. If you're not comfortable with that, you can turn that off. You can just show the graph itself, no buttons. But uh, the buttons, um, I think, are, are, are quite exciting to send the message of growth mindset, both to the teachers and, and to the students. So thank you very much for your uh, attention in, in this uh, presentation. Adam, thank you for inviting me. And I'm happy to you know, uh, respond on the community site or, or, or you know, through Twitter. Um, and uh, you know, I hope that everybody was able to carry uh, away something, something good from it. Yeah, excellent, Simon, for uh, hanging out with us today and presenting this again. Um, I think uh, everybody knows where you're available in the community, but I, I'll tag you in the uh, recording as well so they can track you down if they need to. All right, Adam, thank you very much. And I encourage uh, everyone to uh, read that case study that we had here at GVSU and also some of the other papers. And um, yeah, um, let's let's play some good games. Let's make sure that uh, you know a, a well-played game is, uh, you know, of course, based on uh, fair play and, and what's academics, you know, without looking at, at uh, the benefits of fair play. So I think the game metaphor is just an excellent way to help students, uh, you know, realize what good learning and, and, and good uh, living is all about. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Simon, and everybody else who was here today, and we will see you next month.